This is the Illinois Nutrient Loss Reduction Podcast, Episode 25, Uncovering the Benefits of Cover Crops. I'm Illinois Extension's Todd Gleason. Today, we'll explore the benefits and challenges of using cover crops in a conventional corn and soybean rotation with a researcher and a farmer. We'll start with Lowell Gentry. He works for the University of Illinois and now joins us. Thank you, Lowell, for taking the time. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself and your research? I am a principal research specialist in agriculture in the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Sciences. And uh, I've spent most of my career looking at the nitrogen cycle. So uh, I started out as uh, a trained agronomist in uh, soil fertility and plant nutrition. And uh, we've been trying to tighten the nitrogen cycle um, through all this research, trying to get the, uh, the fertilizer to the intended crop with as uh, little loss as possible. So my work had been about uh, uh, improving fertilizer recovery, but uh, I entered into the water quality world uh, in the early 90s when we started doing constructed wetland projects to use wetlands at the end of tiles to remove nitrate. And so I was thinking, man, this is great, but uh, we're just treating the symptom. And uh, why is all this nitrate coming out of the tile? So we started doing more research in the field. And uh, much of that is the timing of an application, fall versus spring versus split applications. And now we've uh, tried cover crops as well. Where do you conduct all of this research? Almost all of our research is on farm. So we're, we're taking it to the real world. Uh, we're looking at uh, tile drainage from pattern drain fields. Some of these fields are as large as 50 to 75 acres. So our plot size is that large. It's hard to get replication in those situations, but if you do the research long enough, you start seeing that uh, management of nitrogen and, and the rotation effect, all of those things certainly play into how much tile nitrate um, I see. On the rotation effect, what do you see from cover crops? Well, uh, the first time we tried cover crop uh, in our in our replicated study in, in Douglas County was uh, the winter of 2015 to 2016, and we tried cereal rye after corn. I had a soybean, and it grew very well. It was a warm winter, and we reduced the tile nitrate load by more than 40 percent. And uh, so we were off to a really good start. Um, proof of concept that uh, cereal rye can act as a cover crop, I mean, act as a catch crop, um, and uh, soak up a lot of nitrogen that was uh, heading towards the tile, possibly. If we get enough rain, nitrate's nitrate. It doesn't matter if it comes from fertilizer, if it comes from uh, mineralization of soil organic matter. Once nitrogen is in the nitrate form, it can move with water to tiles. and uh, and cereal rye does a good job of, uh, of sucking it up and, and keeping it in the plant. And then hopefully that's released over time and, and gets into our intended crop. Um, and so we just minimize the amount of nitrate that's available for leaching when we have a cover crop. Is it a challenge to incorporate that into the same year rotation, meaning I, this is seeded in the fall and then has to be eliminated at some point in the spring? That's right. And, and I do believe that the overwintering type cover crops work best. Uh, we tried oat and radish for a few years and we just never got enough biomass uh, and nitrogen uptake to uh, impact the tile load. But we are generally drilling cereal rye in after corn, and so that's usually in October. Uh, this past year was November, November 10th is when we got our cereal rye planted, but uh, it's doing pretty well. Um, we uh, terminated uh, ahead of soybean, but last year in one field, we were unable to get in. It was too wet. Uh, unable to get into spray, so we, we actually planted green, uh, something I'd never actually seen myself. We were planting into three-foot-tall cereal rye that was heading out, um, but we still got a very good yield uh, from that. So we think that uh, cereal rye after corn ahead of soybean is the safest place to start if you want to 
try introducing cover crop into your operation. You know, you somewhat boldly stated in a recent uh, report for the Illinois Nutrient Research Education Council that it takes about half a ton per acre of above ground biomass. You mentioned that, or at least biomass. Um, and I'm wondering whether cereal rye has a significant impact on reducing tile nitrate concentration loads uh, and how you get to that much, uh, that that half ton an acre or 0.45 tons per acre. Yes, uh, I'm sort of uh, triangulating on that number because when I see biomass accumulation above a half a ton per acre, I also see an effect on tile nitrate, meaning the concentration goes down. Now, even a huge cereal rye crop doesn't take the tile nitrate all the way down to zero, but I've seen it below one part per million when we have uh, closer to one and a half to two tons. Now, that's a lot of biomass, and, and I do I am concerned that that can interfere with the next crop. So we're trying to get just enough biomass to reduce the tile nitrate load, but not impact the next crop uh, in any negative way. Does it have to do with tracking the number of degree days, growing degree days? It does. We, are, we have a pretty good re regression and relationship with uh, growing degree days when we drill plant after harvest. Um, and I, it seems like we need about 800 growing degree days to get about a half a ton of above ground biomass per acre. And uh, we have tried flying it on and, uh, and that's hit and miss. It really matters if you get a rain right after you uh, apply or, or seed. And, but when you do that, uh, that's often in September, and I've looked at the growing degrees when we plant that early compared to, say, middle of October or beginning of November, and we might have 2,000 growing degree days, yet we don't have any more biomass because the stand was thin and it's shaded for maybe a month as the crop's drying down. So I don't have a good relationship yet with growing degree days when we plant that early and, and then have these other confounding factors. But when, when we drill it and we have a really good stand, it looks like you don't really need any more than a, a half a ton per acre to have a significant impact on tile nitrate load. So those 800 growing degree days pile up in the fall and not the springtime? Yeah, that's right. So when we, when we plant, we've planted uh, as early as the first week in September We've uh, flown it on. We've also used a high clearance machine. And uh, the, both of those are broadcast, and it depends on that rain. And you don't know how long the seed sat there not germinating. If we're not looking at it all the time. Where if the seed goes in the ground, it's got good soil seed contact, good moisture, and, and it germinates immediately. Uh, the seed may germinate uh, at sporadic times when when it's broadcast, and it's just harder to to get this relationship um, between growing degree days and biomass. But, but I'm pretty pleased so far that I, I can say that, uh, for example, last year we got 0.6 tons per acre uh, on a farm in Pyatt County. That was cereal rye um, after corn. And uh, that was actually in continuous corn. And that, uh, that amount of biomass dropped that tile um, from about uh, eight part per million down to uh, almost one part per million. So it was a really nice effect. But there is this trade-off of how much biomass is, is enough to affect the tile but not negatively impact the next crop. Well, that's, we don't have to worry about that as much in front of soybean. But in front of corn, so far, it's a real balancing act. And I'm not out there willing to say we should all be doing cereal rye in front of corn. But we do know that we lose substantial amounts of tile nitrate following soybean production. And it's, it seems like we're carbon limited after soybean and that the nitrate that mineralizes after soybean harvest is, is a substantial contribution to the tile and therefore the river. So we do need a cover crop after soybean ahead of corn, 
And I'm not willing to say serial rise to one because I've seen yield hits with uh, more than a half a ton per acre of biomass, um, the yield hit of the corn. So this year we're trying winter wheat after soybean um, because there's only two plants that I had out there that survived that winter vortex back in, uh, what was that, 2018. And, uh, and it was cereal rye and winter wheat. Both of those survived minus 20. So we're gonna try winter wheat as a cover crop. And uh, in fact, uh, let's see, we just sprayed that uh, last Monday uh, at one of our farms because the biomass, it was getting close to what we thought was uh, the right amount, but we don't want to impact the uh, corn yield. So it's a trade-off. It's a balancing act, at least in front of corn. In front of soybean, it doesn't matter as much how much the uh, uh, cereal rye grows, but in front of corn, you can have too much of a good thing. Then it's not such a good thing. When you say the biomass was close to the right amount, were you talking about half a ton? And uh, and what does the winter wheat crop look like? Is it? I I don't know how tall it would be at that point. It, it's smaller. It definitely. So that's why we chose winter wheat in front of corn, because uh, it doesn't take off in the spring as quickly as does cereal rye, and so. It's, uh, it visually looks like uh, quite a bit less biomass than cereal rye, um, but it was a nice stand. And uh, we want to, you know, if all goes well, we'd like to plant here, uh, plant the corn in late April. And so, uh, you know, we've already killed it. We were, for cereal rye in front of corn, I think you need at least two weeks um, termination to be at least two weeks ahead of planting. And, and so we're just, sort of assuming that's the, the right thing to do in front of, of corn with winter wheat as well. Yeah, and in this case, winter wheat would help control, I suppose, the, the winter annuals. Uh, and when you come back in, it's just your regular normal burn down uh, for wheat control prior to planting. That's right. Um, we also uh, put strips in in the fall. I forgot to mention that uh, we really like strip till with our, our cover crops. Uh, with the cereal rye or the winter wheat, um, if if it's in front of corn, we're we're stripping, and uh, that seems to work very very well on on our very flat soils that are pattern drained. Oh wait, so you essentially have uh, the the strip there, and between the rows, then you have the cover crop. Yes, we we plant the cover crop before we make the strip, so we do kill some of the cover crop in the fall when we make our strips. As you know, we can't always get our strips made in the fall. Sometimes we make them in the spring, and, and I would never uh, recommend no-tilling corn into cereal rye. Those strips make a big difference. And, you know, it, it creates about a 10-inch swath out of the 30-inch row that, that is disturbed, and then that, that makes a nice seed bed, uh, and uh, it warms up more quickly. So that's why we're, we're liking strip-till with cover crops. We are concerned with no-till, um, but we are no-tilling our soybean into cereal rye. Cereal rye, with the ability to fix its own end, doesn't seem to be bothered much by the cereal rye, and we get such good weed control with cereal rye ahead of soybean as well. So for those farmers who want to try this, conventional tillage and strip-till work okay in the soybean side, and no-till was a yes or no? No-till works very nicely with soybean into cereal rye. So that's, uh, that's something we're doing. Uh, we did try strips in front of soybean one time, but then we'd have to go back to 30-inch rows, and we're generally in 15-inch rows. But we thought with a 30-inch row, maybe that'll help us get our, our cover crop uh, uh, growing quicker um, when we seed it into uh, standing uh, soybean. But then again, that's in front of corn, and, and uh, I'm, I'm not necessarily saying cereal rye is the right one, but we're trying winter wheat. And I uh, have also been recommended <clears throat> that we try uh, winter barley, but I uh, haven't tried that one yet. Any advice for producers who want to give this a try? I believe trying cover crop for the first time uh, is safest ahead of soybean. And cereal rye is such a hardy, overwintering cover crop. And it's, it's a simple place for us as researchers to start. 
and also farmers. It's not a mixture. It's not. Uh, it's not very expensive seed, and uh, it's uh, it's just very reliable. So we did uh, create a guidebook um, with the uh, Illinois Fertilizer and Chemical Association and uh, and NREC, Nutrient Research and Education Council. We we put out a sort of a guide book for beginner cover croppers and. Uh, and then this, we've updated it, and uh, it's called uh, Considering Cover Crop, and uh, it can be found on the NREC website. And uh, there's a host of authors and, and various uh, research that's shown in that document to, to back up what we're saying. So I'm not sure I knew that uh, half a ton per acre at the time, but that, that's still not as important ahead of soybean as it is uh, ahead of corn. So I, I, I'm just not ready yet to recommend zero rye in front of corn. I know people are using it and they're, they're having success, but you have to be really vigilant and really be on top of it. And so I think it's just simpler and and, uh, and easier to try zero rye in front of soybean for, for your first foray into cover crop. Again, if you'd like to get a look at that cover crop guide, that's cover crop guide 2.0. You can find it on the Illinois NREC website. That's at illinoisnrec.org, illinoisnrec.org. In the menu, you'll look for resources and then technical information. Hey, Lowell Gentry from the University of Illinois. Thank you so much for taking the time with us. It's my pleasure. Brian Corkill is now here. He's from BA Farms out of Galva, Illinois, and has been doing some conservation practices. Brian, thanks for being with us. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about uh, your farm and your operation? Sure, Todd, and I'm glad to participate. So I farm, have raised corn and soybeans in uh, Henry and Stark counties in Illinois. Farm with my dad. I came back to the family farm in 1990 to after I graduated from the University of Illinois. My family's always been conservation-minded. So currently, some of the things that we do at our farming operation were 100% uh, no-till on soybeans. We strip-till ahead of corn. And with that, we're banding the surface N, P, and K. So we're putting on dry fertilizer, as well as uh, running a little bit of anhydrous in the fall. If Farmers cooperate. We also have implemented the use of cover crops about 10 growing seasons ago. So we have tried to have cover crops planted on 100% of our acres. And t tell me about the acres themselves. Do they roll? Why did you start to use cover crops? What was it? Was it erosion control? Was it something else? Yeah. So originally we started planting cover crops. Um, I guess it was for some for erosion control. We we farm some really flat ground, but we have some pretty rolling ground as well. Um, so yeah, so I, I think that was the first thing that drew it cut us to cover crops was for erosion control and maybe some uh, compaction relief in in areas of fields where maybe we loaded semis or drove the grain cart a lot, things like that. Have you noticed any changes in the soils or the crops since you implemented? Actually, it's kind of hard to measure. Um, we're we're actually uh, a field cooperator for Soil Health Partnership, trying to learn a bit, little bit more about how we are making changes to the soil from from a measurability standpoint. That being said, um, vis visually we've seen differences in the soil, and we've actually uh, some of it through Soil Health Partnership, but some of it on our own. We we do see it. I, Typically, a uh, yield improvement, especially in soybeans, following a cover crop. And, what, and so, as I said before, you know, we started it for soil erosion, but now we're we're looking at more of looking at cover crops as as a way to improve soil health more than anything. So, um, just trying to figure out how to measure that, and other than you know visuals and things like that. Um, so that's part of why we joined. Up with Soil Health Partnership. Over the last decade, how have you changed the cover cropping system? Meaning, have you changed what cover crop you use? Uh, and what were the good things and the bad things that did and did not work? Yeah, so when we first started 
planting cover crops 10 growing seasons ago, we started out with using uh, annual rye grass. You know, it's great. It roots deep, does a good job of sequestering nutrients from the soil. The problem is in our geography, pretty hard to get it established after harvest and have it survive the winter. And we even tried a couple years of, of flying it on to, into standing crop to try to get it started earlier. But we just had a lot of trouble getting it over winter. So we switched after a few years, we switched to using cereal rye and winter barley is, is kind of what we used for the most part. We do have Probably 40% of our acres will use a more diverse mix. We'll throw in uh, several different types of oats, some radishes, turnips, rapeseed, winter peas, just trying to get more diverse roots in the soil for, for different effects, um, all to help not only improve soil health, but sequester nutrients. How do you kill it in the spring? Typically, we use glyphosate, and we'll terminate it ahead of corn. We like to do it about two weeks before we plant corn so we're sure that the cover crop dies and then we have less possibility of having um, olivopathy. So that's why that's why we try to terminate cover crop ahead of corn, you know, give it a couple of weeks to die down so there's less chance of olivopathy. Although last last spring I planted in green into cover crop. Well that that's the other thing you could do is you could plant green into it, but I'm not sure that I'm comfortable really doing that yet. The one field I did it in last year, I was kind of forced into it because of weather, but and it worked out all right. But allelopathy can be an issue. When you, when you say you terminated about two weeks ahead of time, is that essentially just doing a burn down? Yeah. Yep. But essentially we're doing a burn down. Um, we'll, we'll put in our residual herbicide with that, with the glyphosate. And if the cover crop isn't too big, we put nitrogen on ahead of planting with our sprayers. So if, if the cover crop's not too big, we'll throw 45 pounds of nitrogen um, as 32% in with the chemicals um, at that time. If, if the cover crop happens to be, I'd say, over maybe 10 or 12 inches tall, I have terminated it or sprayed it to terminate it, and then a day or two later, I'll go back in and I'll actually, with the same sprayer, and I'll stream nitrogen over the top of our strips rather than broadcasting it, just so we have less likelihood of, of tie-up in the cover crop. Do you side dress the rest of the in- nitrogen in? Yes. So we we run a Higgy sprayer, and we run wide drops of that. So I'll do my last pass of nitrogen, typically around V12 to V16, corn size and at that time we also we throw in uh, some uh, potassium thiosulfate for a little bit of potassium and mainly for uh, sulfur is what we're using it for. How do you handle soybeans? So soybeans we have gone to we'll plant soybeans green so I'll either spray it to terminate it the day before I plant the field or maybe four or five days after I plant it and then we'll terminate it at that time. And whatever size it is, in 2017, I was planting into cover crop that was six foot tall. Um, it, it was soybeans, and it worked out great. And actually, that year we were able to um, curtail some of our post herbicide applications in soybeans because we had such a good growth of cover crop, and we had such a matter as the on the soil surface we didn't really have to do all we didn't have to spray all our acres post it kept the weeds down and we didn't have any weed issues so that was kind of an added benefit do you have no-till acres that you don't use cover crops on and what are the differences between the soil condition between the cover crop and and non-cover crop no-till yeah so a lot of years we don't but once in a while if we don't get all of our acres covered because of weather or Maybe we didn't purchase enough seed ahead of time or something like that. We have had some split fields. In a wet year, I like planting soybeans into a green cover crop because it tends to dry the soil out faster. So it's, it uses up a tremendous amount of moisture, especially as it gets closer to pollination time for the, the cereal rye and the barley. 
So that helps dry the soil out, and, and soil conditions are actually better than than where we just have just bare no-till ground. And then conversely, I mean, if you, if you would terminate it at the wrong time, then that that could be an adverse effect to having a cover crop because if it dies before you get in to plant it, then it becomes more ground shape. It takes longer for it to dry out. Do you run any special equipment on your planter? No, not really. I guess the one thing I will say is, and I know a lot of guys run them, but not everybody does. We um, run uh, vision planning clean sweep. We can put down pressure on our residue managers, and and that does a pretty good job of making a a strip per se when you run through the field with when you're planting. So then the beans have about an eight to ten inch wide strip where they're not really competing with a cover crop to try to get up and get going. Um, but other than that, no, we just run. Well, we have all the precision planks. We have downforce and, you know, stuff like that, but, you know, nothing really special. Any advice for farmers who want to try cover crops for the first time? Okay, it's going to be starting out. I guess my recommendation would be to maybe start out with uh, species of winter kill. They're a little easier to manage. Um, you, know, you don't have to worry about the spring and, and things like that, and you can still get some benefit out of it. Um, guys that want to, you know, skip that skip that route and go right into things like cereal rye and barley and things that that over winter, just have open conversations with your, you know, your retailer and your if, if you work with a consultant or independent agronomist or something like that, and and have a plan going into spring on how you how you want to terminate it, how you want to handle it. You can have some uh, disasters in the spring if you're not not prepared to manage it in the spring. So, you know, make sure you get it terminated. A lot of times ahead of corn, if you have a cover crop, you should probably put on some some nitrogen right around planting time because there could be some, some extra nitrogen tied up to break down residue. Yeah, you have seen that happen, and, and it can be kind of disappointing. So, um I guess those are kind of the main things. That was Brian Corkill from BA Farms in Galva, Illinois. He and Lowell Gentry, a principal researcher in the College of Agricultural, Consumer, and Environmental Sciences, joined us for our episode 25 of the Illinois Nutrient Loss Reduction Podcast. The program was produced in conjunction with Illinois Extension Watershed Outreach Associates, Jennifer Woodyard and Haley Haverback Gruber. As described in the State of Illinois Nutrient Loss Reduction Strategy, Woodyard works in phosphorus priority watersheds, and Haverback Gruber's work is with nitrogen priority watersheds. I'm Illinois Extension's Todd Gleason.